Uh, of course, you know, welcome to the latest Fearless and Devotion, um, hosted by the Fat Ball, as always. Thanks very much for sponsoring us. Uh, you do really well. Um, I just want to talk about the newsletter first. <laughs> Sorry, I keep talking on about this, but um, we've had another one this week. Tim, um, pretty good. You you more or less did this, this one. Um, you had a go at Robert Page, which I think is quite justified, but I think we'll talk a bit more about that. Oh, okay. We'll talk a bit more about that later. I'm just going to share the screen, and obviously this never goes wrong. So, oh, you said uh, we're, we're hosted by this fat boy as opposed to sponsored by. So hello. Well, it's it's sponsored. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Fat boy, great. Um, I'm just going to share yeah. the screen just so if you want to – if you want oh, to – no, no, no it's fine. The end of fucking Nothing could possibly go wrong. Possibly. Um, but if you want to go uh, and uh, sign up for the newsletter, it is £15 for the whole year. Uh, for that, it's more or less 28 p a week. You get like a 2,000, 2,500 uh, word newsletter. Loads of good stuff on there. Tim's done a really good stuff, really good um, piece about Robert Page this week. Um, and, yep, there. That's, that's just taking me to big and bouncy. I've just... I've just tried that. It's taken me to Big and Bouncy. Is that right? Oh, I wanted Asian babes. Uh, oh, something sorry. they would find find in a bush. Um, big right. and Bouncy, triple X dot com. That's where it, that's where it bounced you to. <laughs> All right. For for people who don't know who that is, that is that's just like a that's like a trade magazine. It's there's, there's nothing dodgy about that. Right. We're John joined this week by uh, John Stewart. Let me talk a bit about John. So John um, was with me in school. Uh, he was in my year in John's. Uh, he's from Johnstown. We we're in Grango together. John then went to pay, play for Wrexham, played until he was about 16, 17, and then moved across to the US. He currently lives in South Carolina, is it, John? Uh, North Carolina, Charlotte. North Carolina, Charlotte. Charlotte, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, go on. No, no. So, uh, so John lives in Charlotte. He went to the TST a couple of days ago. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. We might talk about John's sort of journey to 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 the US and also also how big Wrexham is out there, um, which I think is quite interesting. Um, firstly, uh, I want to talk about transfers because Rob McElhenney has been at the baseball with me. Um, well, not with me. We we're in the same box. We were, we're, like, we're like together in in the stadium. But he had pretty interesting stuff about a Conquero. Um, Tim, you're our big Arthur expert. Those quotes are quite, well, they're quite revealing, aren't they? They're sort of saying that he thinks he, I mean, you know what Rob's like? Rob's pretty, he, he's pretty positive about everything, but you wouldn't say stuff like that if he, if he didn't think Arthur was going to sign. No, and it can work on, on, on various levels. He's saying, the cynic could say he's saying something because there's been nothing. It's been literally as flat as a witch's tears and there's nothing's been going no activity whatsoever so we've needed something it's come from the horse's mouth um i kind of suspected that it wasn't just going to be a case of thanks for coming see you later you're going to go into great and good things yeah. i just thought because if it, was, if it was any other club you kind of think well yeah he probably is going to go elsewhere but because of the sway the club holds because of the the, the shot window it continues to put him in. Um, if you read between the lines, the main issue, if he is indeed having talks at Wrexham, still is having talks with them, the big bone of contention will be, well, if I'm coming here, um, then you're going to have to pay me um, and make me your top earner. There's no two ways about it. And I think we've had this discussion before. You know, how do you... You've got to get the balance right there because we all know... Parky's big on team morale and bonding. The last thing you want, and it wouldn't be a mass, I don't think it would massively affect the lads, but you're then saying, right, Arthur, you're worth more than three times the wage and what Mullins on. So you have to be careful with how you do it, and you have to be careful we don't really. Can it be that much? I, th I, I, th I don't know. And again, th there's that aspect. Then there's the other aspect is, is, well, is Arthur kind of like, you know, keeping his cards close to his chest and saying, well, I've not really got much going on at the moment, so I might have to come back here with kind of with my tail between my legs, and which is not a bad, bad option to have. So I, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of always suspected it wasn't just going to be. Thanks a lot. See you wherever you tip up. I just thought, well, he's enjoyed it that much, but there's a lot of other things to consider as well: relocation, happiness, bloody bloody blah, 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 blah sell on free, get out clauses, all this sort of stuff. So. 
And if if there is, you know, the possibility of doing three promotions in a row, you're going to need a statement signing in a key area of the pitch like that. So, yeah, I would no, not I... at all be surprised if we get it. And reading Rob's comments, um, which you know, let, let, I mean, let, let's let's read them out. It was pretty um, unequivocal. Pretty, yeah, I, I'd, I'd say so. Um, I'd say so. I'm just trying to find it now. Where is it? Okay, so he said um, there's a very good chance, basically, of him staying. Um, we're talking to Arthur actively right now. We know he wants to come back to Wrexham, and we definitely want him. It's just about working out the right deal that works for everybody. That that final paragraph is key, isn't it? That, that's yeah, yeah, main, I think so. Yeah, main, yeah, the main thing. Him wanting to come in or wanting to stay is no great surprise. Um, getting the, the the best solution for all parties is the key to all this. And that's where, you know, you want your Sean Harvey of the world here to get it done. Now, no, 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 no. Sean is key. <laughs> Sean has to do stuff like this, right? Sean is the guy you bring in to do these negotiations. Now, for, for me, um, say a Conco, I mean, there's been sort of talk he's on 19 grand at Arsenal, right? He's never going to get that at a, a League One club. Never, ever. So you, you've got to drop that down by almost half, right? And round about half, and you're not in a massive jump from what the likes of Mullin and Lee are on. So I think that's doable. That and a big and a big sort of promotion bonus, a big win bonus, of, mm-hmm. other sort of structured things within the deal. I think that's yeah. possible. So it goes back to what does Arthur want as a 22-year-old keeper? Does he want to play, or does he? Is he happy to be on the bench for a little bit? Is he happy to be on the bench in the likes of a championship club? Because there's no guarantee that you know Arthur will come in and play straight away. If he signs for Luton or something like that, you know he, he's not going to walk into that team. He has to earn it a little bit. He'll walk into our team, but he won't walk into a championship team. If he is going to go to League One, we've got to be the best option for him because he knows us. He knows we're ambitious. And he knows that, you know, there's a big profile there that will help him in his career. So even if he can't get promoted to the championship with us, he knows that there's enough eyes on him that maybe within two or three years with us playing first team football, he can maybe do that after. I think I think Rob is talking now very positively because I think he knows that we've not made a signing and he needs to make some noise in the transfer market. I think... I think really and truly he needs well we need a statement signing to sort of make us just need anything. We just need something. Yeah, no, we, don't. Right. we need kit. a kit. Give us a kit, kit for fuck's sake. We haven't even had a kit. <laughs> kit news, tell us there's a pipe laid been laid on the in the, in the cop somewhere. There's uh, been many pipes uh, laid in the cop was that a cable. A pipe in the cop, uh, Liam. <laughs> yeah, once upon a time, yeah, more than likely. Um, all right, Liam, is there any other transfers on, on, on the go? I've heard Marco Morosi, who's a Shrewsbury keeper, which would be, you know, one in one in the eye for them. But at the end of the day, if you're taking a 30-year-old keeper from, from Shrewsbury who was in a, you know, a, a, a bottom eight League One club last season, is that is that really a statement signing or is he a squad player? Yeah, that's a, pretty much, a, I'd say, a steady adding type of signing, really. It's... It wouldn't be on par with a Conquo. Um, I think the thing you when you look at a Conquo stats is just how many goals he actually prevents. You know, they sort of put the XG stats out there for keepers, and his are impressive. Morosi would be, yeah, I would see I see him as more as a backup option potentially. Um, I do have news from that. Do, illustrious... you, do, do I need to get a jingle out? You, you, yeah, you need to get the jingle out. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Right, I just need to see what's loaded up on my iPod. I can't believe you don't have this. Raining men. <laughs> but yeah, try that. Try that for this week. It's raining. As you can see, we, we've really polished up this podcast in the close season, really making it much more... Uh... <laughs> I like to move it, move it. Can you hear that? I like to move it, move it. You like to all right, that's plenty enough of that. Come on, give me some transfer news, Liam. I am absolutely fizzing at the bunghole for this. <laughs> John, John is sat there going, what? The actual fucking <laughs> doing I, I've heard enough. So, yes, that this is on par with what I was expecting. <laughs> so, start off with I've had a bit of a rundown from Wonder Boy of the positions we're looking at. I don't yeah. think there'll be too many surprises, and it's very much a, a one from each type of box. So, goalkeeper, wing back, centre back, centre mid, and forward are the main. Wait, um, um, do, we, do we know what side of, of uh, wing back? 
It's got to be left side, isn't left, it? Well, from, yeah. from what I've seen it's linked with, um, I think it, you could set strongly say left left wing back. Um, because one of the players that we've been linked with is former Wigan left back or left wing back Tom Pierce. Um, apparently we're the club that's shown the most interest in him. Uh, I why, can't. Why say... is he a former? Why is he a former wing back? Has he has he been released or did he not? Did he not uh, sign a new deal? Uh, I'm pretty sure he was released. Uh, I'll just double Yay. check. Yay! <laughs> player from Wigan, please. Can we, we, we... Was, it, was, was this a Sarah Atherton prophecy when she said um, Wrexham Athletic? Because we seem to be targeting Wigan an awful lot for half of their yeah. players. Do you, how, do, you, do you think that's because they, they don't pay a lot? Like Wigan are a club who've got financial problems, right? And so they're, they're, they're sort of stars and not on a huge amount. So hmm. do we think that there are easy pickings there? And well, if we're going for easy pickings of League One club, where what table are we actually eating at this season? I think we have to ask ourselves that. Yeah, well, I think that if you were to look at, say, someone like Stephen Humphreys, so I've been sort of doing a lot of reading up on him this week. And for his part, the main reason why he's not going to be at Wigan next season is because he said he's been told about the new structure at the club and the financial situation is essentially they can't offer him the terms he wants. So in a player of that calibre's case, I think you'd be looking you know, at a decent signing that who they wanted to keep hold of. Yeah. I... Um, the latest on him is we're still in talks apparently with him. And obviously you've got the James McLean link there, um, played with him at Wigan. Um, I think he offers a bit more up front as well because he can play in several different positions. He can play as a number 10, he can play out wide, he can play through the middle. So I think he offers you, you know, he's, he's two-footed as well, which is, you know, a big benefit in that league. All right. So he's he's played 63 games, sorry, 73 games for Wigan. He's scored 13 goals. So even if he does play on a wide forward sort of role, hmm. he's not prolific, right? He's yeah. he's, he's not scored massive goals for his career. Now, I can understand wanting a bit of an upgrade of a foil for, for, for Mullin. I can. Mm. Someone who's played in League One consistently, someone who, you know, can do the hard yards that, that Mullin needs to, to, to profit, really. But really and truly, did you think we'd be going for some someone like Humphreys to really nail that, that position? Or is Parky just looking for someone who can get us through to through League One again without sort of... What I mean by this, he's, he's not really nailing a position for the next three or four years with Humphreys, is he? Humphreys has a ceiling. It's probably top end of League One. Yeah. So really and truly, that's not what we've been doing in the last couple of seasons. We've been buying two seasons, you know, sorry, two sort of levels above what, what we actually need. So Humphreys is a strange one for me. I think I'd be fine with him if he was just like a part of the striking rotation, but we've got, we've offered another deal to Fletcher. Dolby's under contract. What is this under contract? Ollie's under contract. You know, where's the space for Humphreys? Where's the space for this sort of revolving player? Surely we need a front man who is absolutely going to nail a position next to Mullin rather than, rather than someone who could just be a rotation. Yeah, no, I, I completely get where you're coming from with that. And I do wonder, you know, it, comes to a time now where players like Billy Waters, I think, especially, you've got to come to some form of solution there. With someone like Dolby, I still get the impression that Parky quite fancies him, but that he would probably be more likely to send him out on loan. But yeah. you know, if, if you're going to bring in strikes, though, you, I think we're getting to a stage where you have to, because, so this is another Wonder Boy exclusive. Stephen Fletcher is now highly likely to re-sign. Um, he's obviously been seen quite a lot this week. On training Instagram, with, yeah. training with uh, James McLean. Uh, Aaron James, young defender, is also likely to re-sign. And Mark Howard has agreed a new deal, which I think we were all expecting, to be honest. Uh, yeah, if he's going to be another two, isn't he? Yeah. We could put him up front. We could put him up. I'm sure we'll get onto it uh, in a bit on the TST. But, you know, Mark Howard's shown extra string to his bow this week. Um, the only other real news is that Birmingham City have emerged as front runners for Mark Leonard. Um, who was rumoured to be a target for us. So Brighton yeah. attacking mid? Yes, yeah. That's the sort of now that's the sort of signing that does interest me. Yeah, I'd yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd like that. Yeah, a yeah. player of that sort of calibre is one that 
that would interest me. Like you say, you could take on board for a few few years. So there's you know there's potential there if you look for that. It doesn't have to be Mark Leonard. You know, it's not he's not the be all and end all. But if we're looking at that type of player, that's more the type that interests me than the others that we've been linked with so far. No, I know, I know what you mean. I mean, we've got a, a pretty a pretty sort of well balanced squad um, with like a, a sort of quite strong sort of center to it, but I really and truly, I think we need to supplement that with people from higher divisions now. Um, right. Let's bring John in. Let's talk about welcome to Wrexham. Um, pretty, pretty, I thought it was a pretty good, um, pretty good episode th- this season. Oh, sorry, this, this week, John, firstly, from an American perspective, how big is welcome to Wrexham? Is it sort of something that's, that's trailed quite a bit? Can you sort of get, get away from um, it or is it yeah. something that, Anybody that's in the, in the in the US is actually a fan of soccer, respectfully. Um, most of them have seen it. Um, most people I talk to about that because obviously now instead of saying I'm from Wales or North Wales, I'm like I'm from Wrexham. Obviously, I, you know. So most people do it. It's 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 advertised everywhere uh, within. Uh, it's on FX, so we see the ad running a bunch. Um, it's still maintaining the FX over here. Then it's on Hulu. So. It is popular. It's not just that, obviously, it's the story as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I speak to most people. My both kids play uh, competitive now, so I'm around, you know, the soccer fans as much as possible. So um, it is pretty, pretty big uh, from that standpoint. And it's a great story for most people because nobody, you know, it's, it's Wrexham's not like we're one of the largest cities. It's, um, most people have never heard of it until Rob and Ryan. Yeah, I, I still can't get over your accent, mate. I mean, I mean honestly, when yeah. you were in school with me, you uh, you sounded <laughs> you sounded a lot different to what you do now. Some sort of weird transatlantic. How long have you been over in America now? So um, I was let go from Wrexham uh, back in '96. So I was 18 um, uh, by Brian Flynn, um, and fortunately, Mark Cartwright was a he went to college at London University in Boca Raton, Florida. Um, he knew a coach that was looking for some players. So as soon as I had that, I, I did finish the season off. Um, yeah. Actually finished off with the Welsh FA Youth Cup. The fact, I think the last time Wrexham's actually won it. Um, and from May, from I was able to get a scholarship to, and go over to August. Little did I know it was, uh, well, I knew it was Kentucky, but it was a dry county in Kentucky. So um, so moved there from August. And then I spent one year in Missis, uh, in Kentucky at that school, which was about the best team in the, the nation. Um, it was small college, but it was all ex-professionals, like um, an ex-internationals, Thomas Kojo, uh, was with George Ware, who, like, I think he's the coach now, he was there. Um, so really good luck there. Didn't, um, didn't get along with the coach, didn't like kind of Kentucky that much. And then I went right. to Mississippi, which sounds bad, um, but it was actually by all the casinos and about an hour 15 from New Orleans. So. That was fun. So I finished off my undergrad, played four years. Um, again, at the other school, played with really good players. My roommate, uh, Andy Barron, played for New Zealand in the World Cup. Um, Mark Matumbu, he played. It went back to South Africa, played for Kaiser Chiefs. So the quality was pretty good. But um, So I stayed there, but I realized probably around Wrexham with all the injuries I was getting, I think just a college career was about as good as I was going to finish off. So... Um, moved, got my, uh, got my master's and just, um, and then eventually got sponsored by a company uh, a couple of times and then met my wife, got married, two kids, white picket fence, etc. So been staying here, obviously things have been so much better since, you know, um, back in the day could not keep up with everything as far as in the UK. Uh, you know, you're talking to your parents on the phone now where, you know, it's Facebook Messenger and you get that interaction. So it's definitely better from that standpoint, but it was tough for a few years. So um, I do love over here. I just don't get back there enough. Initially, it was twice a year. Then it was once a year. Then it was once every two years. And because of COVID, it was five years. So, right. Okay. Yeah, which is the last time I was there. So, um, but yeah, it's it's definitely, um, I think it was a blessing in disguise being let go. Um, but nonetheless, it was painful. Um, but yeah, I was at Wrexham since... Um, 92. I um I played against them for Brickfield, and then Scotty Neil was, Roberts's year. Uh, yeah, I, well, I, yeah. I played against Neil since we were eight. So yeah, we we were YTS together. 
Yeah. So I played with him two years. But I, I was either playing against him or playing with uh, with him a few because we were on the representation of the rep uh, teams. Um, but yeah, so you had, I mean, we had some really good players um, in Wrexham. I think David Hughes as well played for Villa. He was kind of around that area. Was he ever, so he was at Wrexham, was he? Because I always thought he went straight to Villa. Um, he may have been in Wrexham. I mean, they, they were rotating people. You know, I was able to um, last three years there, um, but they were bringing a lot of players. So I'm pretty sure he probably had a, um, a good goal, but he shot up to six five. I mean, he was always a big kid, but he, he got... He got tall. Um, he was always yeah. very good to play for Kevin Druids. Um, but yeah, so for the YTS, the first year, Mark McGregor was playing. The year before was Brian Hughes, Yozza. Um, And then my year, Neil Roberts. I uh, was good um, good friends with Neil Wainwright as well. Yeah. Um, and, then the pre- and then the following year, um, Stephen Thomas, Ozzy, came through yeah. and David Walsh. So there was always at least one player that would break the team. Uh, yeah, the first yeah. as well. So, um, yeah, it's uh, back then we were competing against Man United's A team. Uh, we were played the second year we played in, in Lancashire League. So we played against Man United, Liverpool, the kind of that third team, and we're pretty competitive. Um, so that was a good side. But uh, um, and then I actually got a double hernia. On, um, so I was playing for the reserves. Um, got a double hernia. Started off as like um, groin injuries and then um, just finally got diagnosed, had operation immediately and then kind of come back maybe a month before the decision was made. So I was a little shocked when it happened. But again, blessing in disguise, um, long term, if you really can think about that, you know, it's, ni- you know, it's 90 degrees outside, 32 and uh yeah, no, no, yeah, don't hit us in Fahrenheit, mate. We, 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 we've no fucking oh. idea. Yeah, well, I'm bilingual. I speak English and American, so I, I can translate if need be. Um, right, Tim, take us back to the episode, right? Um, I thought it was pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be pretty honest, probably not as good as the last last few. Um, one thing that sort of got me is there was a really big bit on James McLean, but they didn't they didn't give the money shot. They didn't actually they didn't actually say what the the chant was because. <laughs> You know, they, they, went, they went so much beating around the bush, and I thought they actually told the story pretty well about growing up in Derry, about about the poppy stuff. But then they talked about a controversial chant and didn't really say what it was. Well, I didn't really talk about the chant. He just said, you've heard the chant, and if anybody wants to fill gaps in, they can go find it. But the problem you've got is that in one episode, you've got not that far away, you know, we've had the king there, then we've had Prince William there, and then... They go and bang that in, so I can see why they're probably bottling it a little well, bit. They were they were both in the same episode, really, weren't they? It's hard to go. Well, fuck the king and yeah. the prince. Yeah, I, I I'm not that asked to be honest that that it was cut. I mean, who's bothered really? I mean, to be honest, it was more about it was more about him. Um, and seems and a decent all... fella, doesn't he? Seems yeah, like of course he does. A family and, back, background there. I just think you know, I mean. He's, a, he's explained the reason why he doesn't wear a poppy a zillion times, but I don't think it's ever really been documented as with as, as much clarity as that, where you just go, this is the reason why. Here's the archive footage. This is the reason why we call it the bloodstained poppy. Um, and that's that. You, they obviously cut to a couple of sort of, uh, uh, sort of hard line sort of, maybe political commentators saying, well, you know, if he's a man of his principle, he shouldn't have gone and played in England, blah, blah, blah. But easier oh, said than done. Is he, is, he, is, he, is, he gonna earn, is he going to earn the same money in, in the Irish oh, Premier League? You've got, you know, you got to play. You've got to play in the top uh, league. Well, I mean, I'll be honest. I couldn't stand him before he, before he joined Wrexham. Um, Why is that? Like, well, nothing to do with, 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 with those reasons I just mentioned. Just because he's one of those dickheads where you thought... I hate him when he, I used to hate him when he played for Ireland against Wales and he scored against us once in Cardiff and he'd give it the big one. And he, he, you, we see now from the other side of, of the fence what we saw then. So I can full, I, I fully experience what it's like to be a, a fan of, of an opposing team that play a side within a minute. Because he's just, you just think, you just think. Want him to have a bad game. I don't, you sometimes don't care if your team's loses as long as he has a bad game, as long as he doesn't get the chance to wind you up. And he does it so well. But as you said, you know, that you kind of scratch the surface of it all. 
like his missus said, he's, he's pretty boring. <laughs> he just he uh, he watches the football, goes to the gym in the garage, comes back, and that's about it. And you know, we're seeing on the Instagram pictures, he, he's a family man. He's he's had mulling over there doing some boxing. He, he's now hanging around with Stephen Fletcher. So that alone kind of tells me of this. We keep going on about this um, bond at the club. And I would not be the more I the more I think about it, I would not be surprised to see Stephen Fletcher stay on on kind of some reduced terms. To say, look, if you need me as a real kind of backup guy, then I'll do it because he wants to be in and around those players. He'll look at McLean as like the standard bearer for somebody of that age, of that caliber, with that 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 relentless fitness ethic, and go, well, if it's good enough for you. I'm inspired by that, and I'll try and level up to that as best I can as well. You know, Steve Fletcher's a fit guy for his age as well. So, but yeah, going back to the episode, I thought it was really good. Um, obviously, didn't have the the sort of whole emotional pull as the previous two in that sense. Much was made of the of the trouble both on and off off the pitch. You know, with the disciplinary stuff I mentioned, McLean in and around that. Um, the whole fact that we we had a bit more ill discipline last season than the one before. A little bit of fluff around the Tramir game. Um well with the Tramir uh, game, uh with the Tramir game, I, I fucking hate them. This scar is from a FA Cup FA Cup uh-huh. fucking elbow. They, it was just scrappy as can be. So I, I actually have more and a lot more animosity towards Tramir than than I ever had with Chester <laughs> for that. I yeah, mean, you've got to prove it, mate. That's that's fair <laughs> enough. Um, Liam, um, just I was looking at the blurb for it. You know, you, you get the blurb on Disney. Yeah, and it said Wrexham face relegation, and I was like scratching my head all the way through that, um, and trying to work out what what they meant by that. I was thinking oh, maybe, maybe it was the, the women's team if they'd have gone to the bottom four, it, it something was, like yeah, that. It was from the automatics, wasn't yeah. it? Ah, yeah, the right. Top four, okay. The top four have no relegation. They're just going to fight for first and the last. Yeah. Fight for right. Us, okay. Know. Okay. Oh, I sort of get it now. But then I was looking at the table and they were like trying to create jeopardy from the table. And I'm looking at the points going, yeah, <laughs> they're in no absolute bother at all. Um, look, it, you know, sometimes they have to play with narrative. And I sort of get that. And I, and like, I'm, I'm not too. Too, too, too concerned by that because you've got to create that sort of jeopardy, really. And and you know, if you if you live and breathe it like we do, we know we know the ins and outs. But you're telling a story, and you're telling the story to maybe maybe the laymen. So maybe that's where it can sort of where, that's where it can sort of prosper. Mm-hmm. But how did you find the episode? My highlight was Parky and Parkin's remonstrations with the officials yet again. I thought that Parkin took on more of the, the angry guy role. And then Parkin- the referee was telling Parkinson's calm down. He was like, I am calm. So what yeah. do you mean? <laughs> but you know, the best thing, the best thing about that is that uh, Parkin was stood right behind Parky. And Par- <laughs> Parkinson was like, I'm calm. I'm calm. You can just hear Steve Parkin going, it's a fucking joke. He was in the way. <laughs> <laughs> so the referee was like, who's talking to me here? The more you watch it, <laughs> so though, you, you reckon the ref couldn't see him, and he just thought it was like Parky. Parky uh, was doing a different voice. Pa- pa- Parky was here, and, St- and, uh, and Steve Park is just behind him on the way to the to the home dressing room, like like used him as like a dummy. It was amazing. Do you, do you think though that officials, like not all of them, but some of them are a bit like standoffish though? Because I think a lot of like don't get me wrong, you know, Parkinson goes a bit overboard, but what he's swearing at is the decision. He's not saying to like the referee and the officials. You're an F in this, and you're an F in that. I, I like the bit when it, I think it was Stephen Fletcher got pushed over. He was like, "Can you just clarify to me what is the rule when you go in for a header and someone pushes you over? Can you just make that clear?" I was like, "Sometimes he actually makes, you know, quite a fair point, but you just don't get a hearing at all." No, I, I think that's what referees are, are, are more or less like most of the time. Really, I think they have to be like that because you have to have that sort of barrier between you and the you and, and the manager, and you can't sort of admit if you're wrong. John, you'll probably know a bit more more than me yeah, about yeah, I, that referee. Yeah, I actually left a bunch, but yeah, you're, you're always right, even when you're wrong. So yeah. you have to be com- completely committed to decision, and absolutely, it was some of those were bad decisions, but it's all about perspective. If they don't see it, they can't call it. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. It's, it's not so, great. So really the- consistency, I think that's probably the only thing, but Seems like sometimes it's a little more on Wrexham's side again, not no uh, no calls. I think some of those referees and linesmen missed a trick, you know, 
because they would have known, they would have been told, look, we're filming, most people are mic'd up. Chances are it's going to capture some of your audio as well. Some of those, the more savvier referees, you would think they've missed a trick there by really saying, look, look how I reacted to that. Look, look how I used my discretion there. Look how I used some common sense. Would have done them a whole world of favours. And just because oh, like what you're saying is just, it's like they're kind of pre-programmed to just be the way they are. Because we we always we always cite Luigi Colina, don't we, as like the standard bearer for referees, and he's been retired for about 15 years. So why is there no other referees coming through that have any sort of likability about them, that have a bit of common sense? And I just think they missed a trick using the documentary as a vehicle to show, you know what, I'm actually not a bad referee. You know? They, they, I, I wonder if... Just... No, I wonder if you just sort of think, well, that's like a, the documentary is going to be in a couple of months' time. You can't really tell what's going to be in and what's going to be not. Uh, I, I don't know. It's it's hard. I think you, I think referees are very set in in their ways. I think they're very much taught to be like that, rather than there's an individualistic aspect to it. I think I think they're a lot more sort of drilled than they ever have been. I mean, like the likes of David Ellery back in the day, and like you know, Roger Millard is in think people like that. They had their own way to do things, and I don't think you can really have that anymore. I think you have to be. You have to toe the line, otherwise you'll get you'll get knocked down. You'll be back in non-league. You have to sort of really and truly go to the to the process that that the league uh, that the referees association want you to do. Um, didn't Roger Miller? Didn't Roger Miller play for Cameroon? No, Roger Millard. <laughs> I was like, like half half a half a half, a, half a keep. I, I'm I'm going to look Roger Millard up because um, I'm sure <laughs> I can remember really? he had like a big sort of Bill Buffon hair. Robert it was Miller. it was the it was it was the, the well known referee from Wrexham. I've got his name now. Rob, um, uh, John Lloyd. John Lloyd, of course, yeah. Yeah. Uh yeah, I, well. I've just typed in Roger Millard and I can't find him. So <laughs> let, let, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he just doesn't have his own uh, Wikipedia page. He was back in the day. Uh no, no. right, let, let, right, let's talk about the TST because Look, I find it. Look, me and you talked about this last week, Tim, and we found it really hard to get excited because it's it's not a Wrexham team for me. Anything with Gary Hooper in, who you know, I I can sort of remember from being a bit shit for for Scunthorpe. I, I just I don't automatically think, oh wow, that's that's like a proper Wrexham thing. I need to get get involved in. I sort of like the idea and I like the concept, and I think if really if they can maybe, I, I looked. Basically, John, we'll, we'll bring you in in a minute because I know you were there yesterday. But I watched that game yesterday and we just looked a bit slow. We just looked old, to be honest. And and I know we've had a lot of sort of good results in this tournament. We always seem to get to the last 16 and and, and, and fall away a little bit. And I wonder if if we really need a younger younger team to sort of do this. Liam, you watched a lot of it. Uh, did you think it was better or worse than last year? Do you think we've learned from it? Um, do you think we should even carry on? Yeah, I think we should definitely carry on because I feel like the prize money that's on offer is, you know, massive. You know, if we've got so we've got two teams now between the men's and the women's. Um, so they both win a million, a million and, each. Yeah, both. Both. I'm pretty sure both would. If they both won, they would get a million dollars per team. So you know, even if you give some some of the players involved, you're still going to have a decent amount. Um, but actually, I thought that the quality. I wasn't really sure when I saw that the likes of Morell and Trundle weren't playing again, but actually the quality was quite decent. First game was a bit, yeah, yeah. but then I think the next two were the really exciting ones. Sort of Mark Howard coming out <laughs> and getting uh, two winning goals in the the target time. I just love it as a concept as well. It's just quite fun. It's basically there's nothing going on in closed season. You want something to fill a gap, and it's. Just good fun. Like Boyd seems to have become almost um, an honorary Wrexham player these days. Um, yeah. I mean, George Boyd was always a great player, but I just don't, I just don't look, you know, I just don't think, oh, Wrexham, or, you know, when I when I think of his name, that's all. I mean, maybe I'm being a little bit too, too sort of rigid in what I think it should be. Maybe I'm sort of thinking it, it's like a master's concept where you have to have played for Wrexham a little bit. Uh, yeah. Well, you don't, do you? So Roger Espinosa, who scored nearly scored a hat trick of own goals in the match I score, has never even got near the Wrexham team. Well, but the thing for me is, I, I almost feel like should they get some more ringers in? Because if the incentive 
is that high like you know why wouldn't you just take every bet like someone made this point as well like is it a tournament that's better suited for say like futsal type players because it's a smaller game you know sort of seven v seven you know you're not talking full-size pitches are you I, I, I think do. it's a combination. I think it's really a combination. I'm, I, I, we watched uh, Nani FC, which I think they're probably the favourites, and they had four Portuguese internationals uh, playing, but all kind of older. Uh, Nani's in amazing shape still, by the way. Uh, still uh, pretty good. But um, the rest of the players, as you mentioned, were made up not just with futsal, uh, but they actually had um, beach volleyball soccer players as well playing for that team. And, you know, they all just great technique. Everybody needs wonderful technique. Because of the rotation, everybody has to be super fit because you have two minutes of just running in 90 degree heat. But it's it is a it's a completely different game. Um, and you're right, it's great how would score that goal. But a lot of times, like with Nani, they would take off the goalkeeper and put in an extra player, especially in the lower, like when it's 5v5, 4v4, because it's a extra player going forward. So that you should be getting a shot. So things do open up. So I did see a few goals by the goalkeeper or the person who was the goalkeeper coming in and getting the goal. So it's, I think it's a combination. I think that's a problem. They have too many, maybe players who play 11 side. Old school. Yeah. Players old school players. players. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Smaller, smaller sided. Cause it is a different game. You can't play the long ball as much there. There's, there's no space. You need people who's quick with the feet, get half a yard and get off the shots. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I did sort of think we lacked a little bit of pace in the game I saw against the, the reggae boy, uh, reggae sort of rovers, I think. They, mm -hmm. they were just all over the place. They they seemed to always have four back. Uh, and every time we were attacking, even when, when we were breaking, they were still got they still managed to get people up, up ahead of us to, to, to sort of cover it. I just don't think we were quick enough. Uh, John, what, what was it like sort of overall as like an event? I mean, was there a lot of Wrexham fans about? Was is it... Yeah. So I, I grabbed the afternoon session. Uh, I was really hoping the men's got through as well. Uh, got there with my son, got there as soon as it opened. Um, they have the Wake Med field is a proper field and there's two splits, I think field one and two. And then there's a third one, which I spent a lot of time on with some of the games, but they have a bunch of kind of events. There was a Dortmund and a, they actually had a Man City section for Aguero and actually had the uh, premiership trophy there. Um, right which was interesting because I was going to, oh, I'm take a picture. My son's like, do you really want to take a picture with Man City's? I'm like, no, I'm a Man U fan as well. So um, so all that place. So it started to fill up. There were a few Wrexham fans. I didn't really see them. But what was interesting is, so I grabbed a couple of the men's games and then got over to uh, the Wrexham ladies versus US and kind of sat behind with all the Wrexham fans. And looking at them, and they're all decked out in all the, the uniforms, there wasn't one that was an American. They're all local. I think I mentioned to you kind of before. Right. Um, it, I was able to get a hotel room, like the closest to the place, and there was plenty of availability. So um, it shows you how much of a pull that can be for, you know, kind of the Tri-City area there, that they have, you know, 15,000, 20,000 people kind of follow, you know, coming in. Um, so... That was interesting. Um, what was really funny was um, the Wrexham fans, the American Wrexham fans right there, were, were chanting. And suddenly there was a competition between Wrexham calls and um, USA. So I'm like, you know, it's the, and the Wrexham fans were a lot louder. The US fans were, for the girls team, were, uh, ladies team were kind of shouting as well. So that was, that was kind of unique where we have Americans trying to out shout uh for Wrexham versus us so that that was a good side and that was by the way i'm not sure if you watched that that game that was that was a fun game they, they lost in the uh the final kind of goal but three three they they, they did a great job out there just competing so hang on so Wrexham women played uh us us national team so was it an uh, older so, national team i would say this and, and this goes back to even the i can speak more to the men's it's usually you may have some uh, superstars who you know are older, a little bit out of shape, you know, may, may or may not be out of shape, but they've they've come in semi retirement, like the nannies or the grows. Um, and then you have kind of some players who had an okay career, maybe they played college or they maybe played a little bit of semi pro, lower pro. And then you have some of these other players. So that team was in the U.S. national team. I didn't see Mia Hame or anything like that. It was yeah, okay, right. so. 
Um, because the one thing to consider, and we've seen in the last two or four years, US used to be the best because they had the college program, the, because they had a way for women athletes to play at the same level as uh, you know men's college athletes for the longest time. They had some of the best players, the best athletes, because they come from UNC, et cetera. And, and because now all the other countries are kind of competing with the professional kind of setup as well. So that was that was interesting. So they, um, I would say that team they played wasn't as good. They were pretty close, maybe had a few better players, but it wasn't. Um, Rex and ladies really competed and were as physical as them and as fast as, um, you know, as fast as them and did create some chances. It wasn't one way traffic. So good. Good to hear. Tim, does this sort of format leave you a little cold or did you get into it? Um, no, I, I mean, there was a novelty aspect of it last year because well, I'd never even heard of it at that point. I think many of us did uh, over here then. So the novelty aspect of that, um, not, I wouldn't say it wore thin. I just, I just, I don't know. I, I just, um, I, I stand by as miserable as it is. I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy for the breather from football. I stand by that. So it, it, it didn't do anything for me as a gap filler or, or otherwise. I start. It isn't. I know you said it's a little bit rigid, but ultimately, it's an invitational team, isn't it? it, it it's exactly that. Um, you know, Mark Howard's come out, out of it with with some kudos. Um, I would have been interesting to to sort of honed in on you know how kind of Bickerstaff plays. You know, is he putting himself in the shot window for? Well, not probably not for first team action for us, but a move elsewhere, a loan move. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, it's one of those. It might be a grower, um, but I'd be lying if I, if I if I if I said I'd watched everyone with kind of uh, gusto and uh, and a lot of uh, enthusiasm. To be honest, and that's no that's by no reflection on the tournament or or the Rex and Red Dragons in inverted commas. Um, uh, it's just it's just not not for me. Okay, no, that's fair enough, and it doesn't have to be, but yeah, it's still popular. I, I, I understand it's all about growth, isn't it? It's about growth. It's great that the women's team got to, got to go out there as well and play, and it it's quite frantic. It's great as a fitness exercise. You know, it, you, you can be really cynical and go, "Well, how seriously were they taking it? How many practice sessions have they had? How many times did they get together before they got out there?" Probably not. They probably met when they got out there. To be perfectly honest, didn't they? I don't know, but does that really matter? No. You kind of just just going to try and power your way through it and and test yourself against against these other teams and it's like anything you know it's probably an, a massively unfair comparison but you compare U.S. soccer in general in the current climate compared to where it was 10, 15 years ago where it's completely on its ass and nobody was interested in it so you just never know how it's going to go or how it's going to grow so it'll be interesting to see and I'm pretty sure that I think TST already said that there's always a place for Rexman at that tournament so. For as long as they'll they'll have us, no doubt we'll be we'll keep sending teams there, and and we'll we'll totally change our tune when if we when, Gareth Bale, when, when, well, when Gareth Bale tips up playing for Rex. I know Rob McHenney's yeah. again said today we, we we've got a contract in for him. Obviously, not going to happen ever, but you know, just to see, I, it's great. That, I remember George Boyd when he played for Peter Brown. I was like, yeah, he's a good player, etc. But. Yeah, you kind of want somebody who who was like, "Oh, right, okay, we're going to have Aaron Ramsey playing or, or whoever for Rex and Rex and Colors." That's kind of makes it slightly more interesting, I guess, from a Welsh perspective. It gives it a bit more of that local touch to us. But look, yeah. you know, it's 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 a good experience for for some of those players, particularly those that are in and around the fringes of the team. So, from that angle, it's been a worthwhile exercise. John, can I just ask you where is where is US football at the moment? Because there's always been the sort of thing that maybe now we've got North American owners, maybe we should try and like bring in a, a an American player. Um, what, what's the standard? I mean, would you sort of compare it to to Championship, maybe top end League One? Is is that where the likes of you know uh, DC United or, or or others are? Um, I mean, it's been around what. How much is now? 30 years? It was, wasn't it 94, 95 that came out? Um, I would say Charlotte at, is in the second season 
of uh, being in the MLS. And we're actually one of the highest supported teams. Um, we actually have Dean Smith as our current coach. He, oh, he, well, the Villa. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. So Dean Smith's a good coach, and they're doing okay. A little defensive. Um, I would I would equate it to most of it championship, um, kind of championship. Okay. Um, maybe mid lower some of the teams, obviously. Into Miami is a whole thing because of Suarez and Messi and some of the players they're bringing in. Um, so I do think the quality is good and they're adding more more teams, but they I think the issue with the US sports in general is they don't have that whole definition of promotion relegation and there's no plan of that. So typically, even with MLS, you know, they by doing worse, they actually sometimes get better, you know, maybe they get better players in the draft. And I would say the youth system over here is it there's so much money and so many players and so many kind of traveling around i know how much i'm playing just for academy i'm not even doing like proper travel across the country so they do generate a lot of good the good players excellent players but they you know how many transcendent players have they've had over that they've had some you know i i do think they're going to get a little bit better um but yeah but the best players american players are always going to go to europe anyway that's usually where they yeah. they go to they go to the Germany first, don't they? That seems to be a, a yeah, that's common. They do have a thing called MLS Next, so they are trying to bring in younger players. So you start here in about, you know, fifteen. Freddie Adu, he he's still sixteen, isn't he? What's oh, that? Freddie Adu, he's still sixteen, isn't he? It was yeah, he's still fourteen. At uh, yeah, yeah, he never ages. Yeah, that yeah that that was always a little bit questionable, wasn't it? Um, but yeah. It's, I think from a, there's enough, it's popular now. Like um, yeah. I'm on, you know, this is sports radio and they, they call it Charlotte FC. So um, a lot of these clubs, 32 teams, 34 teams is pretty competitive, um, but it's just a different system to the rest of the world. I think one thing that's a little bit that, that, that I still always think hinders, it has its own um, schedule. So they're going to be competing while the Euros and uh, Copa America is on and Copa America is going to be in the same country. So it doesn't quite make sense where they're playing at the same time, whereas the rest of the world are on the normal. Watching something else. Oh, yeah. The schedule. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is it still sort of a, a, a quite big, like Central American, Mexican, Mexican sort of influence on, on, on who's going to the games or are more? No, sort no, of... no not anymore. Um, it's popular in St. Louis, Charlotte, Atlanta. So it is more of a mix. You definitely have, a lot more uh, people from kind of uh, um, from Mexico and and kind of uh, Central kind of America, obviously Cuban and stuff in uh, South Florida. So no, it's pretty um, inclusive with a lot of the groups. Be absolutely right. Depending on the demographic of that specific city, it will align closer to that. Um, yeah. So yeah, we would. Um, Charlotte brings in at least thirty thousand at one point. Oh, wow. When we first we were. We we actually had one of the top. We had seventy four thousand our first ever game, so we can get when wow. Messi comes, we can get sixty thousand, fifty five, sixty thousand. So for some of the clubs, they can get that, but normally it's in the twenty to thirty thousand. So it does equate a little bit to for most games to kind of what championships doing. Yeah, I booked on for Vancouver, um, and mm. I tell you what, I, I mean, the, the actual friendly is quite expensive. So I think we're talking about $140, which I, I, I don't think many Americans or North Americans really bulk at, really, to, sp it, to spend that for a, because, for a um, game. You're going to be paying that. You're paying for a decent ticket for an, an NFL. It's $200, $250. They're used to paying that. I, I couldn't believe it for um, when Wrexham came over. I, I waited and waited, and suddenly the, the prices dropped. But they definitely they definitely get you. Um yeah, I, I'm gonna wait. Hey, I'm gonna wait for the price drop. Also, the hotels in Vancouver are absolutely insane. So, right, okay, Liam, right, five days, uh, five days hotel. How much? How much you paying? Uh, I'm gonna. I'm just. It, I know it's gonna be more than this, but I'm just gonna go on sort of city rates in the UK now. Five nights, you're talking about two hundred quid a night, a grand. I fucking wish, mate. It's seventeen hundred quid for for five nights in Vancouver. Um, oh. Yeah, uh, I know. I'm, I'm, I I don't know what I'm going to do. To be honest, is it, but... is it downtown? 
Uh, yeah, that's downtown. So I'm going. Yeah. Not, if any, yeah, if anyone's got any, if anyone's a Vancouver native and they know a good place to 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 get a hotel, which is like on their on their metro network or anything like that, please please give me a, give me a shout because at the moment I don't want to remortgage the house um, <laughs> to just get a, to get a couple of nights a couple of nights stay. Um, is it always that much to to stay in 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 Americas? Because like when we did Philly last year, it was I was. Doing it for about 150 a night, I no, think. No, it, it depends. There's certain cities, um, and it depends time of year. Like Montreal, I stayed in Montreal, nice place. That that was expensive as well. Um, last night, I I, I used 30,000 miles. I didn't pay for the hotel, so it, it very right. much depends where the game is. Um, but you definitely on the west coast, um, and then obviously including Vancouver on that. I think they're always a little more expensive. So I would look around. It's it can be a little obscene. I, I completely agree. Um, especially when you know, I think a lot of other people are looking at the same time. Yeah, it's, maybe. It's gonna yeah, get you, it's going to get you somehow. Oh, I mean, yeah, I'm I'm talking about three grand for a friendly, uh, but you know, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, that's my decision, and I want to go out and do it because I, I want to go to Vancouver. Tim, mm-hmm. I think we're getting to the end of it now. Is there any any sort of any other business uh, on your end or? Um. Well, Wales are losing again to Slovakia. They're not, are they? Is it, can, can we talk about Paige and Mullin? Because uh, it's getting to a it's getting to a tipping point now with him, isn't it? Um. Well, I've had my say in the newsletter. Go and buy yeah, read it. it. Yeah. Quite good. Um, and there's a few things that 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 get on my nerves about this, and it's not just the whole Paige Mullin thing, right? Because I mean, in that in that article, I pretty much deduced Robert Page as as a liar, essentially somebody who doesn't keep his promises, and I stand by that. I don't care. He's entitled to change his mind. That's fine, but don't say, "Oh, well, mullin has got to prove himself as League Two, and then if he does that, then obviously he's proved himself." Well, he has done it. And he has proved himself, and you still ignored him, and we haven't got a natural striker. So, whilst there's this element of us of Wales going backwards to troll down the lower leagues for players to fill those gaps, you look at the team he's putting out. The last couple of games, it's not a st- it's not a strong squad of players that he's got coming through. That's a fact. That is a fact, right? So you need to start. Well, goals win games. Simple as that. Have we got a natural goal scorer? We've got somebody who can who can knock them in for fun. Not really. Not really. We haven't had them for for, for a while. So I'm. I'm just I'm I'm so annoyed by Page and then the G- Gibraltar f- fast, you know, a friendly against Gibraltar with a bunch of kids. So, all right, would it be a disaster? Well, yeah, it would be a disaster to not win it because Gibraltar has lost nine in a row. They're two hundred eighth in the world. In thirteen games, they conceded fifty three goals. I'm not even citing that. That's that's ingrained in my brain from having to write it the other day. Those are the damning facts, right? And Wales can't beat them. Anglesey beat Gibraltar in a match yeah. years ago, right? So it is beyond embarrassing. The stuff he came out with afterwards is beyond embarrassing. This all this bullshit about a team in transition and a penalty kick away from the Euros. The damage was done by a home defeat to Armenia. That's a fact. That's a tight right? game, right? So, the, so Armenia is a tight game. Gibraltar is a tight game. What do you need in those sort of games? You need a striker well, who knows what the tight game. Uh, uh, Armenia tight turned game. us over by four goals in Cardiff. Not good enough. So he can't suddenly turn around and go say we were a penalty kick away from getting to the Euros, which, whilst factually correct, shouldn't have been in that position in the first place. And I've always been quite pro-page up until maybe the last six to 12 months where... He's just taken us backwards. He's ruining the legacies of his predecessors. He's coming out with a load of gumph, blaming everybody and anything but him. He's not taking responsibility for it. He's had fans. He, he's aware of the cat calls and, and fans calling for his head. But he's not. He's, he's a yes man for the FAW. No Mooney knows it. Page knows it. So it's a happy little thing. Mo- Mooney should have backed up what he said earlier on in the season when he said they reviewed his position. Should have done it then, not waited. And there's this big hoo-ha about whether they can afford to sack him because of the length of contract he's on. And, it, yeah, it's it's a mess. It's a mess. We ain't going to win this. We're going to get nothing out of this friendly. Shock, surprise. Normally, I would have been there for the two, but just just being lost with it. Just being lost with it. Um, and it's kind of... I love going to watch Wales, whether it's in Cardiff or wherever it is in the world, but 
these friendlies were a bridge too far, especially with me thinking about going to the States and everything else. But that, and the flip side of my rant, sorry to go on about it, is not so... I, I can understand the um, the sort of narrative from South Wales saying, well, why should Mullion play for Wales? Blah, 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 blah. Well, unless you're watching Rex and Week in, Week out. You don't know how good he is. Yeah, and there's some, some lads said, "Well, he didn't. He didn't turn up for Newport." Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry he didn't get the menu. Uh, the menu. The, the the memo that he didn't turn up for, for Newport. He can't have great games week in week out. For for the most part, he does, and he scores. So, oh, it's two 0 by when, the way. Well done, Rob Page. Two 0 to Slovakia. Right. So the the thing is with Mullin. Yeah. The thing is with Mullin. When are you going to know if he's good enough? You're going to know if he's good enough by picking him for a fucking squad and giving him a half of football. And if he's not good enough, fair enough. Absolutely. You don't think he's good enough. He's not international standard. That's fair enough. But get him in a squad and find out. Because you this, might be surprised. My bugbear is, as well as the whole page thing, which I've gone over, right? And I'll probably get a few pelts for this. But I get really wound up when a lot of Wrexham fans will say, I'm glad he's missed out for Wales because it'll benefit Wrexham. I, I don't like this, um, oh, you know, club first. Why can't it be club and country? When did it become a competition? Why is it club or country? Why not both? It's mental. And I think that because Wrexham haven't had representation in the Welsh national setup, if you forget Mendy for a minute, or indeed any international honours, right, that there's a bit of apathy surrounding it because we've been out of the league for so long that it suddenly doesn't mean so yeah, much to what it used yeah. to, because I we, we're all old enough to remember when when the Trinidad lads got got called up and and the the league match would be cancelled, but we weren't really that asked. And it was like we're not asked it got cancelled, but we're delighted that they got called up. I was delighted to see Dennis Lawrence grab Michael Owen around the throat at the World Cup. Little moments, and I, I think I think it's really sad that some people or the certain certain fans will go. I, I'm, I'm glad he's nowhere near the Welsh setup. That's mental. That's a, I just find that that's an absolutely perverse way of, of of monitoring somebody's success that it should just be club and not being able to represent your country. It's nonsense. Uh, Liam, are you glad he's not around to squad? I wouldn't go as far as saying I'm glad, but I can empathise with that view from the perspective of <clears throat> well, you know, like. I'm not before you say anything. I'm not comparing the preseason friendlies in the US last summer to a Wales international whatsoever, not at all. But it's just that thing of when you're you sort of pour a lot of your energy into supporting your club. Do you want one of your best players getting injured on duty, which is not that um, for me? No, but I, I, it's not that I don't want him to play for Wales. But weirdly, also, I think. Like, don't worry, I, I get it with Mullin in terms of, you know, he's he's not English because he's Scouse, etc. But for me, I think it meant more perhaps when players like, you know, sort of Steve Evans, people were like that were getting call-ups, people who are actually sort of home ground and talent. I've always found the Mullin thing not weird. You know, it's nice, really, that he wants to, wants to play for Wales, but it's just not quite the same as those players. Um, right. Yeah, I know what you mean. For me, the worst scenario in this is we only have one international and we can't get the game called off and we lose Mullin for, for, for a key match because he's playing for Wales. That That's the, you know, if we get two or three, I'm absolutely fine with it. But but just one, it, 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 it's hard. It's hard for me to, to, to lose our best player in League One when we need our best player because he's playing because he's playing for we Wales. Need, that's, we need to get away from this idea that he's just, that we're just a one-man team. Like It's nonsense. I know he's important, right? But we need to get away from that. We did it. We managed to, to, to acquire some decent points when he was injured. So this whole thing of, well, he's the most important player. We can't risk it. If you can't risk him, mate, you can't risk him for your country, again. if you can't risk him playing for your country, when can you risk him? I we, just we don't get we don't get promoted without without his end of season run of form though. Quite yeah, but if he'd have got that. called it for these two games, we'd never had any any impact on Rex whatsoever. It would have just been a case of him to go. Well, this is what I can do. 
No, no, I, I, I get that. I get that. But what I want to do is get us in a position where we just don't have one international, that we have a few. And then and then I'm fine with it because I know the game will be called off. We'll play it again. But just to lose some of our best players when we're going into key matches because we're in League One, that 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 would hurt me a little bit. I, I'm 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 not I can't lie because I am more club than I am country. I always have been. Look, right. Let, let's uh, let's end this, John. Thanks so so much for coming on. Good to have a sort of a US perspective. Um, I'm not going to see you in Vancouver, am I? You you, know, you can't make it. Yeah, sorry, on a cruise, already booked. So okay, fair enough. Yeah. I was hoping you could uh, you could share a hotel room with me. But uh, <laughs> uh, one enough. one thing about uh, Lily Jones as well. She named the Gennaro Adran Premier Young Player of the Season. So oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah well done to her. Um, some good stuff in in the documentary this week about she her. She's a lovely girl. girl. She does, yeah. Yeah, well, you know. It, it, It'll be very, very interesting to see um, their growth on this on this tour um, when they go over there with, it, with the men. It'd be very, very interesting to see that because I think that will perform part uh, a large part of season four of the documentary is to see not just the clamour for the men's team because we kind of know what it's going to be like now, but kind of to see how the the women's game is going to grow. And I'm sure there'll be uh, a few new players in that squad by the time they get out there. Yeah, I think they'll develop. I think I think the men's team will as well, and I think the first the first signing will be a very good signifier of of what table we are eating at. Right, I think that's it. I think we've discussed everything. Uh, thanks very much for for coming on. Please sign up for the newsletter. You know, stop me eating out of the dumpster. Um, and uh, any any travel tips on Vancouver, uh, please send them my way. But from from me and everyone else, goodbye. Cheers. See ya. Cheers. Bye bye, Robert Page. 3 0. Uh, oh, yeah. Good night. <laughs>